Let's sing that again. For the praises, for the praises of man, I will never, ever stand. For the kingdoms of this world, I'll never give my heart away or shout my praise, my allegiance and devotion, my heart's desire and all emotion. Go to serve the man who died upon that tree. Yeah, only a God like you, only a God like you could be worthy of my praise and all my hope and faith. To only a king of all kings Do I bow my knee and sing And give my every Only a God, only a God like you Could be worthy of my praise And all my hope and faith To only a king of all kings Do I bow my knee and sing And give my everything To only my maker So here's the verse you don't know. I'll sing that for you. It goes like this. Only the God who left his throne above, he came to live with us, came to be one of us, and to only the one who stopped to heal that blind man, took the time to save that one lost lamb, and to only the king who wore that crown of thorns, so I could wear the crown. Of life, and to only the one who conquered sin and death, so we could be set free, so we could stand here and sing. Only a God, only a God like you could be worthy of my praise and all my hope and faith. To only a King of all kings, do I bow my knee and sing and give my everything. Only a God. Only a God like you could be worthy of my praise and all my hope and faith. To only a king of all kings do I bow my knee and sing and give my everything. To only my maker, my father, my savior, redeemer, restorer, rebuilder, to only my maker, to only my maker, my father. is not in here yet. Here he comes. <laughs> hey, Pastor Sam, we are ready for the announcements. You guys can go ahead and have a seat for just a minute. And, uh, as soon as he's done with the announcements this morning, we'll have a time of greeting and welcome. It is my sincere belief you're in the best place in the entire Aviano community to be today, so thank you for being in the house of the Lord. It's good to see you. I hope my mic is working. I don't know. There it is. I had to do a little improvising and lost my clip, so we country boys always make out. You know, we got no bailing wire duct tape to use something else. I'm glad you're here today. If you're a first-time visitor and you did not get a visitor's card, you should have been given one of these when you came in the door. If you didn't get one, let me know, and we'll make sure you get it. It's a little information sheet about all the things we do here at Aviano Baptist, and a visitor's card you can fill out to give us information about uh, where you live and that kind of thing, contact info. We'll be glad to have that. Um, something extraordinary in the life of our church is going to take place this afternoon at 3 o'clock. We're going to have a baptism. We have a young lady made a profession of faith and she's going to be baptized in a swimming pool belonging to one of her really good friends. And I hope they're still friends after this thing is over. Uh, it happens at 3 o'clock. 
the address, all the information has been put out on uh, Facebook, on email, and on our website. Uh, everybody in church is invited. There's even going to be snacks after. Uh, that, that's Baptist bait, you know, food. Um, so uh, I, I don't have the address there before, but I know where it is. I can get it in my GPS. Uh, I don't see the people here who are hosting this. I can't get the address from them either. But at 3 o'clock this afternoon, baptism. And if you haven't found it, look on your, in your computer. It's there somewhere, Facebook, the church website. Uh, I'll be on church.org, just spell it all out, lowercase, you can find it right here. We'd like to have you to witness that baptism at 3 o'clock this afternoon. The very first baptism I ever did as a pastor was in a swimming pool at the officer club at the old San Vito de Normandy Air Station in southern Italy, and it was cold, cold, cold. And I'm anticipating this young lady today will not ever forget her baptism experience. <laughs> all right, um, Jamie Williams is going to come up and make an announcement about Awana. <laughs> um, so I'm going to tell you where we still need help, and if you're feeling led to help, please see me after church. I'm going to be in the, in the <clears throat> Welcome Center, and if you still haven't registered your kids for Awana yet, come see me too so you can register, and uh, we can get another order in for more supplies. We already have one order in, and so I'm really excited. I was at the BX on Friday, and I'm going to go back again today, and a lot of people didn't even know Awana existed, don't even go to church, and so hopefully... They will um, they'll be coming next Sunday night. So if you are feeling led to help Faith and Sparks, which is K through 2, we need an assistant. Um, Amanda and Travis Lozano are heading up, I saw her, are heading up TNT, but he's going to be gone for the first couple of weeks. She's hiding in the back behind the pole. I can't see her. So she's going to need some help for the first couple of weeks in TNT without her husband. And then we're still looking for Trek which is 7th and 8th grade, those wonderful middle schoolers, and a high school. And I also really, 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 really need somebody or a couple or some crazy wild people to lead games. And I'm always looking for people to come in and listen to Bible verses and help out, float around, assist wherever. And I need someone to help in the nursery, too. We're also going to be offering a nursery for um, people who are in the adult Bible study or are volunteering, and Kiana is going to be doing that for us, but we need an assistant. So come see me after church in the foyer and get signed up to help or to sign your kids in. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, by the way, uh, she is doing a yeoman's job manning that table over to BX and doing pre-registration all that stuff. She could sure use some help, someone who could maybe pull a shift or two to give her some relief. So talk to her about that as well. Well, you know, for the better part of a year, we've been talking about the fact that someday we have got to have a new building to meet in because we've been told we have to leave this one. Things have been just kind of sitting still, looking around, sitting around, uh, not moving. Everything's been pretty much inert. And just all of a sudden, it's just taken off like gangbusters. So for the next few weeks, you're going to be exposed to a flurry of activity having to do with a prospective new building uh, for this church. Um, the goal, I think, is to be moved by spring of 2015. Um, there's still some, some very important details to be worked out, like how much is the rent, <laughs> etc. But a wonderful place has been made available to us, and people are looking at it, and they're liking it, and we're, I just got the floor plans, copies of floor plans handed to me a few minutes ago. One reason I'm a little late getting to the sanctuary. But we have a lot of planning to do. It's going to be a lot of activities. It's going to require a lot of participation on your part, and I hope that you will be willing to step up and help. Uh, today, the whole sermon is going to be aimed in that direction because something new in the life of this church is about to happen. We've been meeting right here in this building for 40 years, and now we're going to move. That's an exciting time. So please be uh, alert. Uh, I hope you'll keep an eye on... Uh, we have an AB, just in Facebook, just ABC. That's for the people who are here now. I want to clear, clarify that too. There's an Alabama Baptist Church alumni group. That's for after PCS. If you're still here, you're not yet an alumnus. So just get into ABC and 
That way you can follow our activities. Get our website. It's one of your favorites uh, <laughs> on your computer, avianabaptistchurch.org. Uh, and follow what we're doing because we, we want to try to use media to communicate as much as we can, uh, let you know what's happening and when we let you know when we need you to help and that kind of thing. So help us out with that. Are there announcements I don't know about? Okay, just a little word of encouragement here about praise and worship uh, before we stand to greet each other. In Psalm 68, verses 3 and 4, but let the righteous be glad. Am I righteous? Ask yourself that. Am I righteous? Okay, I'm going to be glad. Let them rejoice before God. Yes, let them rejoice exceedingly. Sing to God, sing praises to His name, extol Him who rides on the clouds by His name, Yah, and rejoice before Him. If that's speaking to you, this praise and worship time is your chance to express your love and, and admiration of your Lord. Right now, let's stand and shake hands with each other, greet each other in Jesus' name, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ. We're going to ask you to sing this song as you return to your seats with us this morning. It's a new song, and it's called I'm Sold Out. I am sold out. My mind is made up. Sing that line with me. I am sold out. My mind is made up. Let's sing that again. I am sold out. My mind is made up. I am sold out. My mind is made up. It goes like this. Who can separate? Who can separate us from the love of God? Not death, nor life. Jesus paid the price and now I'm free from sin and I am sold out. My mind is made up. I am sold out. My mind is made up. I've come through the fire. I've come through the fire and I've come through the rain. But God, He never left my side. But He's my comfort through all the hurt and pain. And I am sold out. I'm sold out. I am sold out. I'm sold out. I am sold out. That's the wrong slide, see Joe. I'm sold out. I am sold out. 
My heart is fixed. My heart is fixed and my mind is made up. No room, no room, no vacancies. I'm all filled up. His Spirit lives in me and that's the reason I'm sold out. Yeah. Is fixed. My heart is fixed and my mind's made up. No room, no vacancies, I'm all filled up. His spirit lives in me and that's the reason I'm sold out. All right, so that's a new song. We're keep working on that one. We couldn't get the beat right, but we'll get there. All right, I will boast.
With a shout I will proclaim Yeah, my God reigns And I worship without shame My God reigns And I will rejoice For my God reigns There's nowhere As you sing over me There's nothing else that I'd rather do Lord, than to worship you So rejoice, so rejoice Be glad, rejoice, oh my soul For the Lord, your God He reigns forevermore I rejoice For my God So rejoice, be glad, your Father and your friend is the Lord, your God, whose rule will never end, I rejoice. For my God reigns, my God reigns, and I dance. shout and with a shout I will proclaim yeah my God reigns and I worship without shame my God reigns and I will rejoice for my God We're going to ask the ushers to come forward at this time to collect the morning offering. You can remain standing. Just remain standing because we're going to keep worshiping as they do that. But we're going to ask them to go ahead and come and pray over the morning offering.
Children's Church can be dismissed at this time. That's up to the kindergarten age today. While they're going out, I want to ask Liz Kitafe to come and tell you the exact address where baptism is going to be held this afternoon. Thank you. Sam and Danny are going to be very dedicated to Jesus this morning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, so we'd like to invite all of you guys out. If you're able to come, it's at 3 p.m., probably till 5, and we're going to have appetizers and desserts. And if you want to come, that'd be great. Thanks. Give me my address, please. Oh, that's right. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Thank you very, very much. Right now, I'd like you to join me in prayer. Father in heaven, I'm so thankful for just the opportunity to be called a child of God, to be able to call you Father, to be part of this church. I thank you that you've given us this privilege. I thank you for everyone seated before us here today. And Lord, how I pray you've prepared a special blessing for every one of them. And I pray, Lord, that today you would use the message you've given us uh, to bind us together and to motivate us to move us forward. There's, there are great challenges ahead, great adventures waiting just around the corner. And we want to be together as we go through this thing. And uh, I just thank you, Lord, for the joy. We've been praying about this building site. And as you often do, Lord, you've answered, it seems, uh, at this point anyway, it seems you've answered with exceedingly abundantly above all that we could have asked or thought about. You've, you seem to have prepared that for us. So we thank you for that. And we just ask the Lord to help us as a church now go through this systematically. You know the little obstacles need to be removed. You know the little details that need to be ironed out. So, Lord, just please take charge. This is your church. You've always provided for it. We ask you, Lord, to do it again. Now, Father, I pray for my wife home today with a terrible bad cold. I just ask you to make her well. We have other people who are ailing in our community. We have kinfolk back in the States who are having problems. My brother this week had cataract surgery, and I ask you to give him a complete healing. Many things going on in the world about which we're so concerned. And Father, we just pray that somehow or another your will will be done in the lives of people, not only here in this church, but around the world today, Lord, that your will will be done and people will come to their senses and all the madness going on around us will cease. We can live in peace for another period of time here on earth. We pray for that. 
Thank you, Lord, for uh, ladies in the church today who are about to bring new babies into the world. We pray for them. They have uh, comfortable pregnancies, safe and easy deliveries, healthy little babies coming into the world to bring joy into their hearts. And uh, we just thank you, Lord, that we as a church get to be part of that special experience. It's a joy when you bring these things into our life, and I thank you for that. Thank you, Lord, for all the people who made things work. Uh, Tom Dowd, uh, Sam Spathy, uh, Shijo Abraham got all the floor plans together and finally found a, a format that they could be printed. They provide those for us. I thank you for those men and their help and ask you, Lord, to bless them. As, and, Lord, just bless us all. We need you to, to guide us. We want to be followers of Jesus Christ. And so we just ask you to lead us as we follow. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One of the big questions that I struggle with as a Christian, and maybe you too, why does God let some people have so many wonderful blessings and other people miss out on that? Some people don't seem to get it nearly as good as some other people. And as I think about this whole thing about having been in this building 40 years now ready for a big landmark move to another place, I'm wondering, of all the people I've pastored in the 13 years I've been here, why did he let this group have the blessing of going through this new experience? And it is a blessing, but for, for reasons of his own, he has chosen this congregation at this point in time to be the people that relocate this church from here to a new location. What a joyful thing it is. You know, there are people who were here 40 years ago, when this church, who are still alive, who were here 40 years ago, and they still from time to time contact this church. Are you still meeting in that same old building? We remember moving in there. What a joy that was. Well, you'll be the people 40 years from now say, are you all still meeting in that building? We were there when you moved in. What a joy that was. You're, 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 you're blessed to have this opportunity to be part of a brand spanking new thing. I call it a new proposition. I mean, we hadn't, we hadn't thought about moving ever since the landlord came and told us you got to move. And so he initiated this, but some visionaries. We have visionaries in our church. Some people went out and found this building. Some other people took a look at it and said, you know, we need a new building. Our church is going to grow as soon as we get enough elbow room. And I thank God for visionaries sitting out there in the pews who are helping make this thing happen. What a joy. But as we confront this new proposition, we've got to get ourselves well grounded in some basic things. I call them old props. There are things we don't want to turn loose of, things we've got to hold on to. You know, you move into a new building and all of a sudden you've got twice as much seating space. If you aren't careful, you'll start doing all kinds of little tricks and things to fill the seats. We don't want to do that. We want to keep the same three props working that have always worked. We want to stay by the basics and do things right. Is my mic working out there, guys? All right. Now, there was a time in the history of Israel when they had been away in captivity in Babylon. Then the Medes and Persians came and conquered the Babylonians and King Cyrus and after him King Artaxerxes began to let them come back into uh, Israel and Jerusalem to rebuild their temple, rebuild the walls of their city. Captivity for 40 years. I am beginning to feel like, as a church, we've been in captivity to this little building for 40 years. <laughs> and now we're getting ready to be freed. <laughs> uh, and we want to, we want to kind of... And, and I go back in the Bible, and, I, and I, I, let me say this too. Very rarely in my 30 plus years of preaching have I ever repeated a sermon... I'm going to repeat one today. I've preached several times. I used to preach it in revivals in, in uh, the States when I got called on to do that. I, I don't have anywhere in my archives any indication I've ever preached it here, but I can't believe I've been here 13 years and never preached this sermon, so I probably did. Uh, you probably weren't here, but in case you were and you, okay, I've heard that before, still go ahead and act surprised, you know, so people uh, will think it's a fresh sermon. It, it is fresh because it's being preached in the face of totally different circumstances. The, the return of Israel, now Bible scholars differ just a little bit on these dates. For example, John MacArthur and our Faith Bible Institute vary by about two years. I'm so glad this is not on the entrance exam to heaven. You don't have to know exactly when these things happen. But approximately the first wave of returning uh, Israelites happened in about 538 B.C. And it's recorded in Ezra chapter 1 through 6 in your Old Testament. There were three men who were keys in that time. A man named Jerubbabel, one named Joshua, not the Joshua from the promised land, but another Joshua, and a prophet by the name of Zechariah who wrote the next to the last book in the Old Testament. Then later on in 450 B.C., under the leadership of Ezra, a scribe, a holy man of God, the second wave allowed, was allowed to go back. 
And later on in 445 B.C., under the leadership of a man named Nehemiah, who there's a book in the Old Testament written by, uh, under his name, thought to have been written by Ezra, but anyway, named Nehemiah. So during that period of time, from 538 B.C. to 445 B.C., give or take a couple of years one way or the other, they came back in, and their task was to go in, rebuild the temple, and rebuild the walls of the city of Jerusalem. And you may think it's strange that I go back to that ancient period to find three principles for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, the New Testament church. But there are three rock-solid things take place in our Bible to tell us what is important. And I want you to learn these things with me today and, and be making your own commitment. Man, you know, I'm going to be part of this thing taking place, this rebuilding or whatever that's going to happen in Aviano Baptist Church. Uh, first of all, we're in Ezra chapter 7. That's why I put various up there for the text. You know, we're, we're in different places in the Bible. But in Ezra chapter 7, uh, so you can have the context. I'm going to begin reading at verse 6, but we're going to focus on verse 10 uh, of Ezra chapter 7. If you don't know where Ezra is, just find Psalms, turn a little bit to the left, you find Job. Just keep on going a little book, you'll find it just a couple of books before Job, you'll find Ezra. This Ezra came up from Babylon, and he was a skilled scribe in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given. The king granted him all his requests according to the hand of the Lord his God upon him. Get that, word, that phrase, according to the hand of the Lord his God upon him. I think the Lord has put his hand on us to be the people at this time to move this church into a new location. Amen. Verse 7, Some of the children of Israel, the priests, the Levites, the singers, the gatekeepers, and the Nethanim came up to Jerusalem in the seventh year of King Artaxerxes. And Ezra came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was in the seventh year of the king. On the first day of the first month, he began his journey from Babylon. And on the first day of the fifth month, he came to Jerusalem according to the good hand of his God upon him. Again, now here's a verse. This verse, when I discovered it, became my key verse as a preacher. It's not my life verse, but it's my instructional verse as a preacher. Ezra 7, verse 10. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach statutes and ordinances in Israel. He was going to learn what God's word was. was. He was going to live God's word, and he was going to lay it out there in his preaching and teaching. You've got to know it. You've got to live it if you're ever going to preach it. Prop number one upon which anything a church does must be founded is the word. We've got to be founded upon the word. We have lots of Bible study programs here. Awana, thank God, is uh, springing up, and, and just wonderful things are happening in the one, our Faith Bible Institute, our Sunday morning Bible studies, we ha have small groups. We'll start meeting here pretty soon in, in homes. We, we believe it's important that all of us learn God's Word. He wrote this book. You see, uh, we call it a book. It's actually a collection of 66 books, but I like to put all that. It's, it's a, a library, actually. But I like to put all that si aside and just say, this is God's love letter to you and to me. Or if someone really important or someone extremely beautiful or rich or wealthy, whatever, or mighty, you're powerful, I don't know what it is that trips your trigger, but if one of those people wrote you a love letter, it wouldn't matter how long that thing was, you'd want to sit down and read every little word because this person loves me and they have wrote me a love letter. Well, God is the most important being in the entire universe, and he has written the human race a love letter, and it's this book I have in my hand right here. So we want to learn what that says how does it apply to our life? What does God expect from us on account of what he has said? Ezra made it his goal to study God's word. And then not only was he going to study it, he was going to obey it. He was going to live it. It's, it's great to have a head full of knowledge, but if you don't let it affect how you live, it's just wasted knowledge. It's biblical trivia. And we don't want to be caught up in biblical trivia. We want the word of God to be a life-changing thing for all of us. We want it to guide us in life. We want it to instruct us, to tell us how to go, what to do when we get there, when to do it, all those things. And it's in the, in the Word of God. So we need to study this and learn it. One time in Albuquerque, New Mexico, a church I was in had a, a weekly visitation program. And I was with this guy. Uh, we went to a door, uh, an address they had given us. And, and the guy I was with was about 6'4", wore cowboy boots, a big old cowboy hat. And I'm, you know, one of this. 
But this fellow comes to the door, and he won't, he, he, there's a screen door there, and he won't open the screen door and invite us in. So we begin to try to talk to him about his spiritual needs, and he says, time out just a minute. I work in a publishing company that prints Bibles. I know every word on every page of that book. I've read them all countless times. It's part of my job. And we were astonished. You ought to be the grandest Christian in Albuquerque. He was an atheist. But he had all the knowledge up here. He had nothing down here. Knowing, knowing the, the word of God, if you don't live by it, does you no good whatever. Uh, there, there's a, there, there's a <laughs> put it in academic terms, there's a, a written exam and there's an oral exam. <laughs> You're going to have to give an account someday for what you believe. So Ezra was going to uh, seek the law of the Lord. He was going to do it. Then he was going to teach it, teach the people. Uh, this, this time frame, Ezra, Nehemiah, Zechariah, a great revival took place in the nation Israel. The word of God had been hidden away for a long, long time. Ezra uncovered it. And in the book of Nehemiah, we'll find a place where they set all the people down. And he, the first time the, the word pulpit's ever used in the Bible, he, he, there was a stand he went up on and he read the law of the Lord. Now, and, and the people rejoiced. They had a spiritual awakening, a great revival. You have to understand, he was reading the first five books of the Bible. I read them, I read them a lot, and there's some exciting stuff in there, but give me some New Testament, would you please? Give me something really exciting. I mean, this is, this is old history, and it's law, and it's thou shalt not, and all this. But it just made the people's heart glad to have a spiritual revival. You, as, as the people attending this church, have got to hold the man in his pulpit, whether it's me or someone else somewhere down the road. Hold this pulpit accountable for teaching you God's holy word. Amen. It's got to be done. There's a reason why God put pastors in churches. That is to teach people how to do what God wants them to do from God's holy word. It cannot ever be from a man's personal opinion, from his own personality. It can't be his own ideas about things. It has to be God's ideas brought from the pulpit, laid out before you, explained to you so you can understand them and then do them. The word, that's prop number one. Moving into our new building, the preaching can't change. Uh, the style of outreach we have can't change. Amen. What we promise people when they come to church can't change. You come over here, we're going to expose you to Jesus Christ. We're going to keep on, as, as, as a group of Christians, we're going to keep on learning to love Jesus more. And as evangelistic Christians, we're going to keep on trying to lead other people to come and love Jesus. And we're not going to change that. We're not going to put on dog and pony shows. We're not going to have bells and whistles, all that stuff to attract people. Amen. We're going to have the gospel message of Jesus Christ. The Word. We're going to study it. We're going to live it. And we're going to lay it out there for people to learn so they can do the same thing. This is a call to be faithful in learning, obeying, and sharing God's Holy Word. There's another prop that is essential. When I, go to, when I would go to preach revivals, I would always tell people there are three things that hold a church together and make it work, make it successful. Eliminate any one of these three in a church, you're going to tilt it. It may even fall. Essential prop number two is found in the book of Nehemiah, <coughs> chapter 4. Again, so you get the context. I'm going to start reading at verse 1, but verse 6 is our key verse. Nehemiah 4, 1 through 6. But it so happened when Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall that he was furious and very indignant and mocked the Jews. And he spoke before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they complete it in a day? Will they revive the stones from the heaps of rubbish, stones that are burned? Now Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him, and he said, Whatever they build, if even a fox goes up on it, he'll break down their stone wall. And then Nehemiah begins to pray, Hear, O our God, for we are despised. Turn their reproach on their own heads. Give them as plunder to the land of captivity. Do not cover their iniquity. Do not let their sin be blotted out from before you, for they have provoked you to anger before the builders. And here's the key verse. So we built the wall. And the entire wall was joined together up to half its length, for the people had a mind 
to work. The people had a mind to work. They were facing serious opposition. They were doing something to people who'd been living around there seeing these destroyed walls. This can't be done. If a little fox could jump on that wall and tear it down. We're, we're facing obstacles. There, there's going to be opposition as we complete this move, as we go through these, these uh, negotiations and, and final, finalize the transaction to, to rent a new building and, and get moved into it. There's going to be opposition. We need to expect that. Why? Because what we're going to be doing is preparing ourselves to more forcefully attack the kingdom of, of, of Satan. And he's going to bring opposition against us. But here's the point. If we are unified, and you need to read the entire book of Nehemiah to find out how unified these people were, how they lined up on the wall and one guy was responsible for this area and the next guy took the next one and how they worked together. One guy would hold a, they'd hold a spear in one hand and a trowel or a tool in the other to work. They were unified. The people had a mind to work. Lots of churches feel like when they've called a pastor, they've got their cowboy, put him on a horse, turn him loose, watch him run, and sit here and wait for him to get back and tell you what happened. Now, that's not how church is supposed to work, folks. That is not how church is supposed to work. Every child of God has been called to do service for the one who saved him. Now, I've got a couple of things here I just want to share with you. Number one, who produces the work? Who are the workers? In Ephesians 2, we have verses 8 through 10. 8 and 9, you probably know very well already if you've been in vacation Bible school and Sunday school from your childhood, you know these. But number 10, uh, verse 10, some people choose to ignore, I do believe. Here's what it says in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And verse 10, for we are his workmanship. That's a Greek word to be translated workmanship, his craft. It can also be translated masterpiece. And when I preach on it, that's what I like to call it. You're God's masterpiece. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We should walk in good works. Now, when the Bible uses the word walk, it's talking about your lifestyle. The lifestyle of every Christian should be invested in doing good works for the Lord Jesus Christ so that he can be honored and glorified through us. The work belongs to the people who are saved. If, if verses uh, 8 and 9 apply to you, you've been saved by grace through faith, that not of works, then verse 10 also applies to you as, a, as an individual Christian. You have been uh, cr created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that you should just live in these good works. Always doing good in the name of Jesus so Jesus can be honored and glorified through you. The ministry belongs to the people. And I'm hoping, I'm hoping and praying, already fervently praying, that every person who attends this church will adopt some part of that new building and say, I'm going to be responsible for those empty chairs right over there. And I'm not going to quit till I put somebody's carcass in those chairs in this church on Sunday morning. Amen. I, I'm going to be responsible for, there, there's a room over there that sometimes needs a little cleaning. I'm going to, I just think I'll adopt that room, make it my thing to keep that room clean. I'm, I'm going to adopt some other part of the ministry of this church. I, I'm going to get on a committee and help them conduct the business of the church. Somewhere in this church, there is a job for you to do, and God prepared it ahead of time. So you can just walk around doing this work, this good work for the Lord Jesus Christ. It's out there where the work is produced. But then we have who prepares the workers. This is also found in the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 10 through 13. He who descended is also the one, capital O, uh, meaning Jesus, who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. The pastoral leaders, the evangelists, those people in church, are here to prepare the people to do the work of the ministry. I get 
a little bit bewildered sometimes because I think people who sit where you're sitting hear people who stand where I'm standing saying things like this, and you think we're doing it out of selfish desires. We want you to take some of the load off our back. Uh, you want us to get busy so I won't have to be so busy. Uh, that, well, that's only partly true where I'm concerned. <laughs> I have come through years of experience to understand, and some of you know this as well, the great joy in being a Christian comes not from sitting and being served, but from rising up and serving. The great joy in being a Christian, the greatest victories you're going to ever experience, the greatest thrills you're going to ever have come from serving the Lord and seeing Him work through you. So our job here is to prepare you. That's why we're going to, that's why we're going to find the law of the Lord. We're going to live it. We're going to teach it to you. Preparing you, equipping you to do the work of the ministry. We have all kinds of tools and ministries in place to do that. And we just need you to take advantage of that. But the workers, you, you've got to have the Word of God as a basis. You've got to have the workers as the practitioners. And then you've got to have some power. It takes some power. By, by the way, this thing about the workers, this is a call to be faithful by serving and giving faithfully to ensure the successful completion of our new proposition. It's a call to be faithful. Point number three, I call it simply the wind. We're going to go to the book of Zechariah, but let me explain to you why I call it the wind. I, I have fun with words, but this is not one of my fun things. This is a, I use it purposefully, intentionally, and I, I'm going to give you a couple of, of New Testament verses so you'll understand why I call this the wind. In 2 Peter 1.21, we read this. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. The Greek word there, the, the, the words were moved, translates a Greek word that is found back in Acts 27, verse 15. When the ship was caught, could not hit into the wind, we let her drive, and running under the shelter of an island called Clauda, we secured the skiff with difficulty. When they had taken it on board, they used cables to undergird the ship, and fearing lest they should run aground on the uh, Syrtis sands, they struck sail and were driven. It's a word the Holy Spirit used specifically about like, like wind filling the sails of a boat and carrying it across the surface of the water, driving it ahead of it. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. Now here's why that is important. In Zechariah chapter 4, again we're going to read verses 1 through 6 so you'll get the context. Verse 6 is the key. Zechariah was one of those first leaders, but his book comes last in the Bible and, and his point perhaps the most important of the three we're talking about today. Now the angel who talked with me came back and walked, awakened me as a man who is wakened out of his sleep and he said to me what do you see? So I said I am looking and there is a lampstand of solid gold with a bowl on top of it on the stand seven lamps with seven pipes to the seven lamps two olive trees are by it one at the right of the bowl the other on its left. So I answered and spoke to the angel who talked with me saying what are these my Lord? Then the angel who talked with me answered and said to me, Do you not know what these are? And I said, No, my Lord. So he answered and said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. The lampstands were there, the olive trees. Olive oil in those days was used as a fuel to light lamps. It's the, the trees were there to, to provide the power to burn the lamps. The Lord says to this man Zerubbabel who led the first group coming out of Babylonian captivity, his uh, immediate task was to start rebuilding the temple and God wanted him to know it will not be by might nor power. It doesn't matter how many people you got, how strong they are, how hard workers they are. If it gets done, it will be by my spirit, says the Lord. Prop number three, the essential prop, the one that absolutely cannot be removed it has to be the Holy Spirit of God working through us, working through His Word, working through His workers, empowering all that we do. God the Holy Spirit has got to do the work. We just have to be His vessels, His tools as He leads us forward. Now, oftentimes I think we Baptist people get a little shy about talking about the Holy Spirit. We think, okay, if we say that word too many times, they're going to think we've gone Pentecostal or uh, something radical and people will look at us funny. But understand this. Nothing good ever happens in the life of any Christian except God the Holy Spirit is involved in it and doing it in your life. 
It has to be that way. Without that, we have no power. Men with their talent, their intelligence, their knowledge can accomplish a few little things that will bring a few benefits for a short period of time to somebody perhaps. Eternal things, the things that really count, are only going to be accomplished through the power of God the Holy Spirit working in and through His people. You and I need that. We must have that. We, sure, we, we need to know the Word. We need to be willing to work. But if we are not depending on God the Holy Spirit and if He is not involved in what we're doing, we face utter failure as a result of all our efforts. We have got to have God the Holy Spirit. Well, how do you get that to happen? Well, first of all, as individual Christians, we go back and on our knees one more time, and I say one more time, hoping this has happened many times in your life. One more time we say, Lord, I know who I am, and that's about nothing. I know who you are, and that's everything. And Lord, it doesn't matter what I do, if you're not involved, it's going to fail. It's not going to produce anything of lasting value. Lord, I need you at work in my life. You invited him in when you were saved. You need to go back and invite him in over and over again as you, as you take on different things, as you face different challenges, as you accept different roles in the church. Lord, get in this with me, please. Let your Holy Spirit be the power behind me. Motivate me, move me. Be like that wind in my sails. Drive me across the surface of the water. You know, here's a, a good thing about this. The water can be smooth and calm. We were... We, Adele and I took our grandson down to Cowley to the beach last week, and we had days there when the water just, as the tide is called, it's like a tabletop. There were times when the chops were about 18 inches high, maybe not, nothing really violent, but you know, we've seen them when they're coming in feet high, you know. It doesn't matter what the condition of the sea is out there. If the wind is in the sails, the boat's going to keep on driving. It may be doing one of these numbers, but it's going to keep on proceeding forward because the wind is in those sails. And as we go into this challenge, this new proposition about a new building, getting located, being able to afford it, being able to furnish it, and then fill it with people, we're going to have some smooth waters. We're going to have some rough waters. But if the Holy Spirit, that wind is in our sails, moving us forward, it won't matter what the condition of the water is. Our boat's going to keep on moving. And so we need that. How are you going to get that? Pray, 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 pray. Surrender, 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 surrender. Sometimes one of the hardest things born-again Christians have to do is get out of the way so God can actually work in our lives. We, we're saved. We know we're saved. We're happy to be saved. But my goodness, I still want to keep control of some stuff here. I'm going to be responsible for the things I do. No, don't do that. Let God have it. Let the Holy Spirit have it, and he will move it forward for you. The word, the workers, and then the wind in your sails. You give me any church anywhere planet where those three things are functioning the way God wants them to function, I'll show you a successful, victorious church that Satan cannot stop ever under any circumstances. That to me is a fail-proof church when those three things are in position. You need to make up your mind how much of this new proposition are you going to buy into? How available are you going to be to help us accomplish our mission as we look for a new home and then get into it and and begin to function there as a church. I hope you'll say, Lord, I'm in it all the way. You fill me in and I'll fill whatever role you give me and we'll just get this job done. And one of these days, uh, way down the road maybe, I'll look back and say, y'all still meeting in that building up there? Man, I helped move them in there. What a joy it's going to be to look back someday and see the things God let you accomplish while you were here. Yesterday, Picked up, well, well, it was kind of helping Al and Sarah move some things from our house to their new apartment and had Sammy in the car with me, and Al was working. I didn't want to get involved in that too much, so, Sammy, let's go find something. Uh, we'll, we'll get your dad and mom something to drink. Let's go down the road here. So we started looking for a place where we can, you know, get a, I wanted one of these granita things with coffee, and, you know, but couldn't find any place. But we're, So we're driving on, we're discussing what, what, what you going to get when you get there, Sammy? You want a milkshake? What do you want? And uh, he, he's a... I think it would grow to be a, a comedian. He said, he said, well, Papa Sam, I may get a, a donut because, you know, that's just how I roll. <laughs> uh, there is a way that we Christians roll. <laughs> and it's around God's word, unified as a body of Christ, working together, the Holy Spirit of God moving us, and we roll. 
There, there are ways that we're supposed to function. And we need to know what that is. And we need to do it God's way. Would you pray with me? Father, we're so thankful for all the years this church has met right here in this building. We have no way of knowing how many lives have been touched, changed, hearts brought to surrender to Jesus Christ for salvation, Christians rededicated, people called into the ministry or missionary service. We don't, we don't know. But we do know that during our years, it's been many, many people in the 13 years we've been here to see it. And we just thank you, Lord, for every heart that's ever been touched right here in this place. But it seems now that all the signals are saying it's time to go on. And we face this new proposition, getting into a new home. Lord, we need to be unified as we go forward. We need to accept this challenge. We need to look at it as an adventure. We need to get all our little ducks in a row and be sure we do things correctly. Then we need to do them with zeal and with fervor. Your Holy Spirit moving us forward. We're praying for a day, Lord, when we can look back and say, okay, it wasn't as easy as we thought it would be, but we got her done. And it's time now to go on to bigger and better things in a new location. Father, bless the people sitting before me today. I pray that out of this message they've received something. Somehow they've renewed a commitment. They've strengthened their zeal for you. They've uh, got deeper in their commitment to, to serve you and be part of our family. I just thank you for all who are here and just ask you, Lord, now to bless us as we close our service. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I haven't said anything very evangelical, but you know, the workers, who are the workers? They're people that Jesus Christ himself, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, has recruited out of the devil's crowd and brought them into the family of God. Those are the workers. He may be kind of knocking on your door today trying to recruit you. You may not yet be on the inside. He's saying, listen, I want you to be part of this family. I want you to be part of God's family, and then I want you to be part of what this church is doing. If you're here today and you're not saved and you know it, would you please just take the next few minutes and just look into your heart and say, you know, is it better I keep on doing things my way, or is it better I become a follower of Jesus Christ? And if the Holy Spirit says, no, follow Jesus, then you make that commitment and say, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to repent of my sins. I'm going to turn my back on my sin. I'm going to repent. I'm going to ask Jesus into my heart. I'm going to trust him. And I'm going to become part of this family of God. And whatever they're doing here while I'm here, I'll help with that. And then I'll go somewhere else and I'll help with that too. I'm going to become a follower of Jesus Christ. Would you make that commitment today and then come share that with us so we can just rejoice over the victory that's come in your life. You may have been saved for many, many years, but during your years of salvation, you haven't done much in the way of serving the Lord. You've kind of still been serving yourself and just doing the convenient stuff when it felt good. You may want to come and just kneel in this altar. Lord, I, I really need to get the cobwebs out. I need to dust this thing off. I need to get my life back where you can use it. And I'm surrendering to you again today for your service, not for your salvation, but for your service. Just come and kneel here. You don't have to talk to me. Talk to the Lord. He's the one who can help you. If you're here today, your body's here, your church membership is back in some other church you left, we'd like to talk with you about how you can be a member here. Some people uh, have special relationships with their church. They don't want to take their membership out of that family church back there where people are still praying for them. That's fine. We have another way we can make you a member of this church. And for a while, you'll have two memberships. And uh, when they do censuses of Christians, you'll get counted two times. Hallelujah. Uh, <laughs> uh, come and talk with us about that. Any special prayer needs in your life, we're here to minister to you. We'll pray with you. You come as we sing this song. Everybody, please stand. And as the Holy Spirit of God moves, you move too. And we'll help you any way we possibly can. Created me.
by being here today. I thank you for your attendance and your attention. I pray you take something home with you today that helps you as a child of God. Just a quick recap of the announcements this afternoon, 3 o'clock out in Fort Chia in a cold swimming pool. We're going to have a baptism service. Uh, you may want to attend that. Uh, see me try uh, to walk on the water. Uh, I'll probably do that. Uh, uh, Awana uh, work, work is still needed and starts next Sunday night at 5 o'clock. We praise God for that. If your children aren't enrolled, please get them enrolled quickly so we'll know. Uh, you, you know we need numbers so we can plan and prepare. Uh, oh, and something I didn't say earlier, we got two new mamas in church. They're going to have babies in the next three weeks if things go like they're supposed to. And so you cookie monsters out there, get those pots and pans washed up. We're going to be preparing some meals for new moms here pretty soon. That's uh, Hallelujah, I love that. It's just great. Okay. You're going to sing a song now to get a song in your heart, a smile on your face. Go your way rejoicing. When somebody asks you what's wrong with you, tell them, Jesus, that's what's wrong with me. My soul finds rest in you. My fortress and trust in you and I will put my hope there too I will stand upon your word and I will not be shaken I will let my praises show holding on to what I know because I know you're always there and I will not be shaken I will not be shaken thanks everybody have a great week see you next Sunday